This morning, if you would take your Bibles with me, we're going to start in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, we're going to start reading in verse 9 and going on to verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 18, starting in verse 9 and going to verse 14. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you dispossess, listen to the soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. You know, I've talked a lot about the last several weeks about being a special people set apart to do good works and now here in Deuteronomy what you see is you see God doing just that for his people he's separating them from the customs of the rest of the societies around them and he's telling them to avoid them because of these things because people kind of went about and did their own thing and didn't obey the voice of God it came to a point where God started driving them out of their land and bringing in his own people And he's warning them. He's saying, don't you make the same mistakes. Don't do it. He says, avoid them. And that's one thing as Christian believers that's so important for us to understand that there are things in life, there are things that we're going to come across that we must avoid as believers because they carry with them a consequence. A consequence that we do not want to be a part of. I know whenever I go out somewhere with my kids, I'm always instructing them. I'm always telling them this thing is good. This thing's not good. You don't need to do that. And we'll come up to a a grocery store aisle and it will be full, full to the brim on each side of candy. And they've tasted the candy before. And it's delicious and it's wonderful and they love it. And they'll bring a great, big bag of candy to their dad and they'll say dad would you get this for me no it's like but dad it's good yes it is good would you buy it no but dad why say son do you have any idea what would happen to you if you ate all that candy He looks at me completely confused. He's like, I know exactly what would happen. It's delicious. It is wonderful. It's like, no, that's not what would happen. You would be sick. It has so much sugar, so much stuff in it that tastes good in a small portion, but once you get a lot of it, it makes you sick to your stomach. No, I'm not going to buy that whole thing for you. What you're reading about here in Scripture is God saying, now listen, He says, maybe you'll look at some things and they will taste good to you. But the end result, when it's full blown, you're going to hate it. And he says, avoid it at all cost. Avoid it. Do not go near it. Do not touch it. Avoid it. Because God is just like a father to you and I. He knows what things are going to lead to. He knows what's going to happen if you go farther with it. So he tells you from the beginning to stop. And not only does He tell you to stop, but He itemizes it for you. Though it's itemized here in the Old Testament, it continues to be taught in the New Testament. Look at how it breaks it down. It breaks it down to sorcerers, soothsayers, witchcraft, one who practices omens, interprets omens. And He breaks down all these different things. Conjure spells. You look at the things that were predominantly popular just a few generations ago and even continue to be so now. Books, movies, different things that have been very popular that include these things to the letter. And you see where society has become, what we've become. You start to ask yourself, is there truth to this? 
Absolutely there's truth to it. The further away you get from the commandments of God, the more things start coming into your life that you do not want to come in. The only problem is we didn't recognize it at first. We let it get to a point where it started doing us great harm. Follow with me a little bit in Scripture. Let's go on over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, starting in verse 19. John chapter 3, starting in verse 19 and reading on to verse 21. John chapter 3, verse 19, it says this, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and that men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may clearly be seen, that they have been done in God. Now listen to this in verse 19, because this is powerful. It says that this is the condemnation that's come into the world, that the world and men love darkness rather than light. And boy, that's the truth, isn't it? You look at the season we're in today, everything seems to be centered around darkness. The holiday we're in, the decorations we're in, everything seems to be just shrouded in darkness. And that's what we come into a lot of times, is that sin, evil, things of this world, they love darkness. They do. They absolutely love it. When my kids try to hide something, they hide it in a dark place. When you have something that nobody wants to be seen, what do you do? You put it in a dark place. And what does it say? The world loved darkness and didn't love God. Why? Because He's light. He exposes darkness. This is exactly what happened in the Old Testament with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were shown not how to make man righteous, but to show that man needed God. It was to show that man was sinful. God exposed our condition with the Ten Commandments. That's why they're hated now. That's why when they get put up on the, on the courthouse lawn, all of a sudden people scream murder. Because they look at that and they realize we're not where we need to be. It offends. It hurts. It cuts. It, it pours salt in a wound because it shows us how wicked we truly are. And they say, no, put it away. Why? Because we love darkness rather than light. Light shows me i got to get things right with God. And that's why sometimes the Word of God offends because it shines light on things that we don't want to be seen. We don't want to see them. We don't want other people to see them. And the world loved darkness rather than light. If you go on further to the next verse, verse 20, it says, For everyone practicing evil hates the light. That's just what we're talking about. And does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be more clearly seen that they have been done in God. Church, one of the things as a Christian believer is that I come to Christ not to hide my condition, but to give it to Him that He may cure it. That He may fix my condition. That I can be a new person in Jesus Christ. I have said it last year, I'll say it again. It seems so bizarre to me that in my Christian walk there are things I believe all throughout the year, but I throw them out one day out of the year. I throw them all out. I tell my kids throughout the entire year, I tell them, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. 364 days out of the year, I look at my children. Do not be afraid. God is with you. God will protect you. Do not be afraid. One day out of the year, I celebrate fear. One holiday out of the year, I celebrate fear. I tell my kids, death was never a part of God's plan. Death was never a part of God's plan. It's a curse. God is life. You have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Christ loves you. He cares for you. He's done all these things for you. But one day out of the year, I celebrate death. One holiday out of the year, I celebrate death. Everything gets turned on its head in Christianity one holiday out of the year. And we stand back and we say, oh, this is of God. No, it is not. No, it is not of God. And it makes people angry. Why? Because men love darkness rather than light. That's what it says right here. And what did the Bible say back in Deuteronomy? It says, avoid wicked customs. Why? Not because God's trying to take something from you. He says, avoid them because they bring with them a curse. They bring with them a curse. 
the holidays that celebrate this, they bring fear, they bring anxiety, they bring depression, they bring horror, they bring terror, they bring all these things. And God says you could have avoided them all. You could avoid them all. Just cast off those works of darkness. Just cast them off and come back to me. I have people every year, they tell me, they say, now, Pastor, I think you're going too far. No, I'm not. Absolutely, I'm not. The Bible, there's not one scripture that will defend the characteristics and teachings of the holiday that we're in. Not one. There's not one scripture that justifies it. As a matter of fact, you go back to Acts chapter 19. Go ahead and turn there with me. Acts chapter 19, starting in verse 13 and going to verse 20. Acts 19, verse 13. It says, Then some internate Jews, exorcists, took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus, who they ha- who, the name of Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. There were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest who, and a Jewish priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known to both all the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. Listen to this story. Now, it's amazing to me. I preach out of the Bible, and we all clap and applaud, and we say, man, Jesus, He is God. If Jesus is God, that means there's a devil. If there's a devil, that means there are demons. If that means there are demons, then that means that they can affect those who are not in Jesus Christ. And when you read the Scripture right here, it says that some men thought we can speak Jesus' name, have no relationship with Him, and demonstrate we have power. The Spirit recognized the condition of these men, that these men had no relationship with Jesus, beat them and overpowered them. All of a sudden, people who had no relationship with God whatsoever, people who did not believe in the name of Jesus, but upon seeing this became so scared, realizing that there really are demons and spirits and things to avoid in this world, that they gathered up their books of magic and burned them. Didn't say they were believers. It said that fear fell upon them all. And they got rid of them because they saw what it was and they wanted no part of it. I remember a time my mother, when she was a young girl, my mom is a a very, very laid back individual. She has no stories like this except for this one. But she remembered going to church one day and a couple from church invited her out to their home. And she went, and she had a wonderful time. Evening came, and they asked my mom and some of the girls and young ladies that were there, they said, do you want to play cards? Yes, absolutely. We'd love to play cards. And they pulled out these cards. Mom thought she was going to play Euchre. Very popular in Indiana. you got to love Euchre if you live here. Very, very popular. She thought, we're going to play Euchre. It's going to be a great time. They pull out these cards. Mom's never seen these cards before. She has no idea what they look like turned out they were tarot cards they turned out all the lights they form a circle and they start having a seance my mom got caught right in the middle of it and all of a sudden in the middle of it the table started floating in the middle of the room as mom tells the story she said I tried to let go of everybody I couldn't let go they wouldn't let go of me and mom said all I could think to say was in the name of Jesus let me go And when mom said that, the table fell to the floor, the lights came on, and they told my mother, get out. And she was kicked out of the house. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. There's power in His name. And these things that go on this time of year, they are not games. They are not for children. They are not make-believe. They are the occult repackaged. That's exactly what they are. 
And as believers in Christ, as a church, we need to have nothing to do with it and say, get it out. Because when we look in Scripture right here, it tells us avoid these wicked customs. They will bring a curse on you. They will bring a curse on your family. They will bring a curse on your home. Get them out! And that is the problem with the church. We play games with the name of Jesus and His Word instead of taking it as the Gospel truth. It is not a game. There are spirits in this world. And God says to avoid them and to walk for Him. As we look at this in Scripture, it says that when they burned these books of magic that there were, there were many people who were brought to the name of Jesus Christ. And in verse 20 it says, so the Word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. I remember when I started preaching against Halloween, there were many churches that didn't want to have me back. I started preaching when I was about 16 years old. I preached this in many different churches. As I preached it, I made a lot of people angry. <laughs> I made quite a few and they would kick me out of the church. Because back then, you didn't see a lot of the things you see now. But see, the Bible tells us one thing, that the nature of sin is death. And that's exactly what it gives when it becomes full grown. It brings death. When you look at this holiday, when you look at Halloween, and what it was when, when my grandparents were young, it looked very, very innocent. But over the years, it has grown. And it has grown to a very grotesque and disturbing level. The decorations are disturbing in and of themselves, enough to give my children nightmares just when they see the decorations. And we say, how did it get to this when it was so innocent? Because it was never innocent. It was sinful from the very beginning. And it did exactly what Scripture says. It grows and it matures. And when it's full-blown, you see exactly what it is. It is death and it is evil. When we go forward in Scripture, if you take your Bibles and you go to Galatians in chapter 5, this is so, so exciting to me. The Word of God presents things so that you don't have to know a lot of Scripture to know if something's good or bad. You just have to know a few basic things. And when you go to Galatians chapter 5, it starts giving us something that we all heard about in Sunday school, and that's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit and then the works of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is such, I'm going to read them to you real quick. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25, it says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now I'm going to stop here for just a moment. Because in verse 22 and 23, it breaks down what the acts of a Christian's life should reflect. What it means to be not only a person in Christ, but the characteristics of Christ. You can look at these things and pretty much stack them up against anything that's labeled Christian and it can give you a good indication very quickly on whether or not something is lining up with God or not. And when you line these up with the holiday that we're in, there's not one attribute that I read off that's listed in this holiday. Not a single solitary one. There's nothing there. If you go back just a few verses to the work of the flesh, you find all kinds of them. But you don't find any of the fruits of the Spirit in there which tells me that the Spirit of God does not dwell in it, which tells me I need to avoid it. I look at the very basic components of it. I look at it, it celebrates death, God's a God of life. It celebrates fear, God is not a God of fear. It tells me that in 1 John. It tell, I look at it, it, it celebrates trickery and deception. God is not in, involved in trickery or deception. I look at the fruits of the Spirit. I say, okay, God, if it doesn't line up here, does it line up with any of these? Is there love? No. Joy? No. Peace? No. Long-suffering? No. Kindness? No. Goodness? No. Faithfulness? No. Gentleness? No. Self-control? When I was a kid and I got a bunch of Halloween, there was no self-control. We had all kinds of candy. We bloated ourselves. There's no self-control. Not one of these things are listed. So start asking the question, is God in it? Is God in it? I remember one time when I was in college, I, I was so honored. I was the chaplain of the university I attended. I got to speak to a lot of students from a lot of different backgrounds. 
And I remember one conversation I had about this holiday with a young woman in class. And we had a very intense conversation. I gave a lot of scripture. She argued that, that the calendar itself was, was pagan. And yes, our calendar is pagan. It absolutely is. But the holidays we celebrate have so many wonderful Christian characteristics and they're holidays worthy to be celebrated. This is not one of them. And we talked for a long time. As it turned out, this woman was a practicing witch. She was involved in the occult. She was a practicing witch. And I praise God before the semester was over, she gave her heart to Jesus Christ and she got out of that. But in that conversation, her eyes were open to where she could see some things. And a lot of other students were too. Folks, God did not come to take anything away from you. He's come to give you life and to give it more abundantly. He's come to give you victory where there is no victory. The fruit of the Spirit are things that God wants to bring into your life to better your life. Not to detract from it. Not to steal from it. But to make it better. God warns us of these things not to take away a holiday that we love and enjoy, but to bring something in that's going to truly benefit our family. I've had several people ask me before, they say, well, pastor, you think dressing up is evil? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. My kids love to dress up. Not during the holiday. They love to dress up throughout the year. Now, we don't do these wicked things like the Bible talks about witchcraft and sorcery. No. But if, if Adelaide wants to dress up like a tater tot, I'm going to laugh and I'm going to take her picture. Of course, that's not going to be during Halloween because we don't want a part of that church it's good to laugh it's good to have fun it's good to celebrate it's good to eat candy it's not good to go against the word of god and his teachings we've got to learn how to obey the word of god in all things and be able to go forward celebrating god and his goodness and building up a character in ourselves and in our families and in our children and our churches that reflects that of jesus christ that reflects his character and his love and his compassion and I see too many compromises in the church today. Too many. Too many. We, our business as a church is twofold. Twofold. To win souls for the kingdom and to grow them in spiritual maturity. That is our mission as a church. That is our mission. Don't get off mission, church. Continue to win souls for the kingdom of heaven. Continue to grow them into maturity for Jesus Christ. We do these things and we will be blessed. Music can come on forward as we bring the service to a close. I love my kids so much. There's, as we've talked throughout the, the years and as they've grown and matured, they used to ask me, when, when, especially when Aiden was just really, really little, he used to ask me. We'd drive around the town and do different things, and every time around this holiday season, he would look at me and goes, Dad! Dad! Look! And I'd look and someone have their house all decked out with Halloween. He said, they worship Halloween! I said, son, it doesn't work that way. It, it, it doesn't work that way. No. And he'd look at me all confused. And I said, son, sometimes we have trouble seeing what is good and what is bad. Sometimes we have trouble finding the right path to go. He said, it's our job to share with people Jesus Christ. As a little boy, he had such a desire, and he still does, has such a desire to do the right thing in Jesus Christ and to see people grow in that knowledge of Christ. And from a young child, he can look at something and he can know whether it's good or bad in many ways. He's got a lot of growing to do, but I can already see it. As a Christian believer, Many of us, we're still growing in Jesus Christ. We still have trouble seeing sometimes what is good and what is bad. And making that distinction can be very, very difficult because Satan makes it difficult. He's a master of deception. But that's where we go back to the Word of God. Church, that is our anchor in all things. Go back to the Word of God. Open up that Word of God and start asking the hard questions. See where they line up in Scripture. Because I'm telling you, as much as you may want to hold on to something, if it doesn't line up with God's Word, it is not helping you. It is not aiding you in any way. It is hurting you. Whether you know it or not, it is hurting you. 
and it's taking you places that you do not want to go. I understand it being hard to say that this thing that we've done for so many years isn't good. But I also understand what happens when we refuse to let it go. I know what happens when we refuse to let it go. Because other things follow. The Bible tells me in Romans, it tells me the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23 As a believer in Christ, when I came to this altar as a young man, and I bent my knee and I knelt down and I asked Jesus to come into my heart and be my Savior, I knew from an early age I was going to have to say no to some things. That at times I was going to have to be the oddball the one who did something that nobody else would do. But in that moment, I realized that I should love Jesus so much that it doesn't matter if I'm a little strange or odd to others. I serve the Lord. I serve Him. And because of that, I deny my flesh and I take up my cross and I follow after God. When Paul was ministering in Ephesus, there were so many people caught up in so many things. They had no idea. And when they saw it, they couldn't get rid of it quick enough. They're throwing out their books of magic one after the other, throwing them out. And Paul never stood there saying, I told you, I told you, I told you. He never did that. He stood there and he said, Now, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He loves you and He cares for you. And the church grew mightily during that time. It was a time of revival. You may ask me today, you may say, Pastor, what, what brings revival? What actually brings revival? What turns the tide and changes everything? When God's people humble themselves and pray, when we repent of our sins and we turn from our wicked ways, when I come to the altar in tears and I say, God, I am done with this. I've done it all my life and I realize now I don't need it. And I start throwing it out. I throw it out and say, God, I don't want this anymore. It's got between you and me and I hate it. I hate it. And I throw it out. I throw it out. I turn to my spouse. I turn to my friends and my neighbors and I confess the wrongs that I've done and the errors I've made and the mistakes I've made. And I say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry and I repent on my face and I cry out and I ask for forgiveness, then revival comes. Then God does something new. Then God opens up your heart. Then He opens up the doors of heaven. Then the blessings start to flow in your life. That's what starts bringing revival. It's never about a fiery sermon. It's never about finding some new revelation. It's about humbling yourself before the mighty hand of God and saying, I'm sorry. I am sorry for what I've done. Satan is a master of deception. He deceived a third of the angels of heaven to rebel against God. How much more can he deceive you and me? If I'm not armed up in the Word of God, I will be deceived by the tricks of the devil. He has deceived many. And I pray today we be deceived no longer. That we finally put a stake in the ground and say, I will not move from here. I will not move from here. Look at the world around you. If something is popular in this world, should it really be popular in this church? I say no. Because you're special. You are special to God. You matter to Him. And He wants to do something brand new in your life. Not something old. He's not going to resurrect something old. He's going to do something brand new. If you let Him. If you let Him. That's the challenge this morning. Will you let God do something new? God forbid that I should ever celebrate death. I war against it. I war against it in the mighty hand of God. 
God forbid I should ever celebrate fear. I war against it in the mighty hand of God. God forbid that I should ever celebrate those things that are contrary to the Word of God because I am His and not this world's. So I challenge you today, I pray today that whatever need you have, whatever burden has laid on your heart, whatever you need to pray about, that you come to this altar and give it to Jesus Christ. Let revival start with you. Let revival start in your heart this morning. And watch what God will do. Whatever need you have, whatever prayer you need to pray, for anything God has laid on your heart this morning, I invite you to this altar. It is open. Whatever need you have, I invite you. Please come.